afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's, to today's webinar. My name is Ian Culbert. I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Public Health Association, and I'm very pleased to be hosting today's session uh, on promoting population health, health equity, and climate action. Uh, this is a joint initiative of the Canadian Public Health Association, the Canadian Health Association for Sustainability and Equity, and the Ontario Public Health Association. Uh, I want to uh, start by acknowledging that while we're joining today's webinar from all parts of Turtle Island, uh, CPHA's offices and my home from which I'm joining, uh, you are located on the ancestral unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe. Today's webinar is being recorded uh, and will be made available on CPHA's YouTube channel, um, probably within the week, we'll see. Uh, uh, but all registrants will receive a uh, notification when the uh, recording is available. Uh, all, of our our, all of our presenters have agreed to have their presentations uh, posted uh, uh, as well. So those will be available in the description of the video online. If you want to ask a question, we ask that you use the Q&A module. And I'm realizing that I was supposed to launch a little poll. So while I continue my introduction, if you want to let us know where you're joining today's uh, webinar from and what sector you work in, that would be great. Uh, now I completely forgot where I was at, but uh, I will just continue along uh, and say, uh, did the recording, did the um, uh, presentations, um, did the land acknowledgement, you're all joining in. Um, so I guess that was pretty much all I had to say, unless Kim's going to tell me something else. Ah, see, men can't multitask. Isn't I just proved the rule, didn't I? Uh, well, very glad to have you all with us. And very glad to have our presenters with us today on this really important topic. So um, I have noticed that there's a comment that chat has been disabled. I will try to fix that so that we can use chat to communicate with each other. My apologies for that. So we'll just end the poll. We'll see where everyone is at. And we've got a good cross section, not the entire country represented, but a good uh, good representation from public health, which is great. So uh, thanks very much for participating in that quick poll. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, today's moderator, Kim Prada from the Canadian Health Association for Sustainability and Equity. Kim, the floor is yours. Hi folks, thanks for joining us today. We have three speakers. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves when they start. But I just wanna say that this project that we're doing collaboratively, what we're trying to do here is bring forward the strategies that different public health organizations are using to actually promote public health, um, population health, health equity and climate action. We recognize that not in all cases is climate action one of the goals, but we feel that sometimes it's an unintentional goal. And so we really want to bring that um, into relief for the public health sector. And so, um, and the other thing I'd just like to mention here is that, um, and I've totally lost my, my train of thought here. Um, oh, that there, the, there are three speakers today. We've quite intentionally um, asked people from, from organizations that are situated in different ways. So Inga will be speaking to us from public health in Ottawa, where they're actually situated in the city of Ottawa, with the, they're, they're part of the city of, of um, Ottawa. Kate will be speaking to us from a public health organization that's actually embedded in the region of Niagara. And then Rita will be speaking to us from a nonprofit organization that, um, that works in alliance with a number of organizations, including including a number of public health organizations. So with that, oh, and I will just mention at the end that there is an evaluation survey. We'd really appreciate it if people would complete that for us. It helps us to um, organize ourselves in the future and to make um, the future webinars even better. And then one last thing here is that we have actually asked people here to speak more as a peer-to-peer -peer session to really focus on lessons learned, opportunities that they kind of jumped on and um, challenges that they faced and things that worked and things that didn't work. So we've really asked them to kind of um, address their comments to those kinds of issues. So thanks very much. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Kate. Great. Thanks a lot, Kim. Um, so I'll share my screen. So it's a little iffy with Zoom. So I'm hoping everybody can see my slides. Um, all right, I'm gonna take that as a yes. Um, so um, hi everyone, it's great to be here. Um, 
I, uh, my name is Kate Harold, and I work at Niagara Region Public Health in Ontario. Uh, I'm speaking from the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe. And uh, my role at the public health unit I'm at is Strategic Initiatives Coordinator. And I kind of lead and help coordinate a lot of the health equity work. So I think an important part of when we're talking about impacting health equity at the Niagara region is some background, first of all. I saw most people are from Ontario and are probably familiar with our setup, but uh, Ontario has about 35 health units. Um, and as Kim mentioned, some are standalone and others are in integrated as part of regional government. So our public health unit is part of regional government. And so that's kind of where our uh, project fits in. So in 2018, um, our public health unit kind of embarked on a health equity strategic plan for our department. And after that started, our medical officer of health, Dr. Mustafa Herji, saw an opportunity to expand the scope of that health equity work to just beyond public health and to uh, kind of the rest of our corporation into the non-health sector areas. Um, so that's what led to this health equity informed planning project uh, to be able to identify opportunities um, to impact health um, outside of a traditional health sector. One important part I think that really helped move this work forward is it was written into bylaw. Um, so it was recognized as a corporate strategic priority. And in 2020, it was written into bylaw to establish social determinants of health as a consideration in program and budget decisions. Um, so it was really crucial to kind of have that corporate and council support for this work moving forward. So just an overview of the work. So as I mentioned, it's called our Health Equity Informed Planning Project for the region. Um, and a project plan was created and the project aims to address the unintended impacts on health or health inequities that result when decisions are made in non-health sectors. Uh, we had three main goals outlined. Uh, the biggest focus for the last year and a half has been goal one, to increase those considerations of health and health equity during decision making. And uh, specifically, we've been focused on that first objective, which is to incorporate HIAs or health impact assessments into our regional planning. Uh, so that's kind of what I'll talk about in the next few slides. But an important part here that I wanted to mention is when this started a year and a half ago, we built a health equity informed planning support team that had representation across our departments uh, to help create our process, review our tools and resources. So there is people from public health, from public works, which would be our transportation team, water, wastewater, uh, our community services department had representation and um, our planning team. So it was important to kind of work across, collab like collaboratively across the region and aligned, we aligned and worked closely with our finance team as well. So going into what, if people aren't familiar with what a health impact assessment is, this is just kind of a brief description. Uh, so it is a World Health Organization recognized tool that we adapted. Um, and it's a combination of procedures, methods, and tools by which a policy program or project may be judged on its potential effects on health, frequently used outside of the traditional health sector. So it was fitting for what we were looking to accomplish. Um, it's been used in a variety of areas, most commonly in the world of like transportation and road builds in the built environment. Uh, there are quite a few places across the world who use HIAs, Quebec uses them, uh, Vancouver has a really great HIA guide for their transportation and uh, planning work. Toronto has used them. Um, outside of Canada, Europe uses it. Uh, cities in the US do, but um, I think from what we know, and maybe someone here could tell us differently, but I think Niagara Region is the first to kind of take the approach of integrating it um, into our regional planning process. So um, it's been very interesting. An important part, of course, as everybody on this call is probably familiar with, is the social determinants of health. So this was a crucial term to define when we were um, kind of doing the rounds and introducing this work to staff at the region, um, highlighting that you know health of a population is closely tied to the, where people live and work, and that all sectors are responsible for the health of a population. It was an important step because working in public health, this is kind of um, by nature we do uh, SDOH work, but uh, working with different project managers in different sectors, this was not as a familiar of a term. 
So recognizing your audience and who you're talking to and reiterating some of these key terms was uh, a, a key part of this work for sure and rolling this out. This is a visual to kind of help highlight kind of the work we do. So it's essentially addressing the social determinants of health across projects through this health impact assessment approach with these five steps uh, with the ultimate goal of achieving greater health equity. So these are the five steps outlined from the HIA process. Um, the first is the screening step where we identify projects um, that could benefit from an HIA screen. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like on the next slide. The scoping step goes into what level of HIA is needed and how much resources and research. Uh, the appraisal, or also known as the assessment step, is kind of doing that dive into what are the health impacts of some of these different project actions. The recommendation step is coming up with those mitigation strategies, either to uh, you know, minimize any negative health impacts of a project, but oftentimes also amplifying positive health impacts. And then that final step is uh, a challenging one, which is kind of, you know, evaluating the intended impact we were hoping to have. So this is the, a visual of our screening tool, that first step I mentioned. So uh, we worked with our finance team to figure out a process of kind of uh, integrating our HIA work into our like annual capital projects budget. Um, so annually projects get submitted. Uh, for budget and we built in questions to kind of narrow in what we might want to do an HIA on that included. Is this project net new? So it's not just a repair, but a new build maybe. Is there natural impact on an SDOH or a priority population that we should consider? And from that, we have a list of projects that we then do a fulsome screen, which is this tool that we created. Um, and it outlines all the different social determinants of health. And we work with the project manager to score it on a scale of each uh, factor on a scale of negative three to three, negative three being high negative impact, three being high positive impact, and it's all calculated uh, to produce a final score that kind of points us in the direction of what level of HIA we might need. Um, an important part here that we found is that the negative scores are weighted heavier in our formula, um, knowing that if there is a negative impact, we want to make sure to be able to mitigate that. So these are, this is the scoping step for the different levels of HIA that we came up with. Um, so there's the rapid, which is um, if it scores a certain score, it requires an HIA, but maybe not as fulsome. So we rely on secondary data, existing data, and limited to no stakeholder and community engagement. If the score is a little bit higher, we move to an intermediate where uh, we look at secondary data, but also collect some of our own and do some engagement with the community. Comprehensive is all that um, to, to a, a greater extent. Um, a lesson learned from this process over the last year and a half is that we found some projects were on the cusp of needing an HIA, but not quite fully based on our scoring system. So we've actually added that condensed level um, because we recognize that although it may not score based on our criteria, there still are some opportunities to recommend health impacts. Um, and so we're just, we've just come up with that new level in about last few weeks. So it is an iterative process. Um, and another thing we're considering is the caveat of if a project is impacting a school or a hospital, um, that's something we also may wanna to flag to make sure that we're looking at it from a health lens. Um, so I think um, an important part too is figuring out, you know, once a project's identified as needing an HIA, where in their project life cycle are we trying to fit ourselves into? Uh, an important part is getting into the planning process. That's the earliest stage where we're able to create recommendations that ideally would be able to be implemented. Um, we also make sure to align with whatever is happening in the project anyways. If there's community consultations happening, we jump on board that. We also align with any ministry mandated um, assessments. So in Ontario, there's environmental assessments needed for most projects. So we align with that um, work as much as possible. Our ultimate deliverable is a health impact assessment report for each of our projects with um, a list of recommendations to mitigate any negative health impacts or amplify any positive health impacts. So this example on the screen is there was a road reconstruction done. And so we had a list of recommendations. Some of the categories that the recommendations might fit into our design, 
education, partnership opportunities, and some strength in communication. An example that ties, um, I think, nicely to this conversation today is that improved aspect of active transportation facilities. So um, making sure roads are built to allow for more than just car use and uh, people are able to walk and cycle and scoot. Um, so that's a big one. I think that's come up quite a bit. My last two slides are just highlighting our current state of work and some of the lessons learned. Um, so we have a process established for some of our capital projects. We actually created a guidebook that's just being finalized. We have two final HIA reports and two should be done by the end of the year. Overall, right now we have eight ongoing um, and we're looking to explore a process for our operational work and wanna strengthen our communications plan. And some of the lessons learned is, it, I mentioned already, it's very important to have that corporate support and council support that help move things along. Communication is key, making sure you know, you know your audience. I've gone into meetings where I assume people know what health equity means and that's not always the case. So starting at baseline knowledge, having dedicated resources to this work is, has been great. We actually secured permanent funding this year for a municipal health impacts advisor to do all this HIA work, which has been awesome. And the support team was great as well. I mentioned it's an iterative process where we're constantly learning new things and tweaking things. So that's natural. Um, and then leveraging any projects that are ongoing in the community or internally in your organization where you could um, um, align work or work with each other or not duplicate efforts is always an important part with some of these projects as well. And all this to say the ultimate impact is to have a stronger impact on health equity across Niagara region. So that's my presentation. So I think I'm done now and I will pass it over to um, Rita. Oh, that's wonderful, Kate. What a, what a fantastic project and so lucky to have that embedded. Um, that's fantastic. Um, so hello, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Rita Kutsudimos and I am the executive director of the BC Alliance for Healthy Living. And um, it's my pleasure uh, and, and privilege to be joining you uh, this morning from the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish um, <clears throat> and Seisha, where I have the, the privilege and, and, and I'm very grateful to be able to live and, and to raise my family on these, on these uh, wonderful lands and, and waters. So the BC Alliance for Healthy Living is a group it's an alliance in the truest sense. It's made up of, of nonprofit organizations, and you can see them there at the bottom of your screen, that came together to address the common risk factors and health inequities that contribute to chronic disease. So BCHL has long been a champion and advocate for active transportation because of the multiple connections and ways that transportation really is a, a, a determinant of health. And and of course, everyone here knows from a from health perspective, built environments have a significant influence on whether people are physically active, have social connections, can access healthy foods and services um, that enhance health and wellness. Um, and, and when we look at active transportation, we also see, of course, that has climate impact climate and equity impacts. And of course, with the climate impacts and with the equity, there's, you know, it, there's a spiraling other, other um, implications. So, so the, the climate and the health impacts from, um, from climate impacts, you know, um, <clears throat> It really is um, somewhat circular. So there's a need obviously to shift down our greenhouse gases and in British Columbia, transportation is one of our single uh, largest sources of greenhouse gases. Um, and, but it's also in terms of uh, providing active transportation op options for those who cannot or, or do not drive is, is so important from uh, across a number of equity seeking groups, um, whether it's low income, people with disabilities, newcomers, uh, children and elders. 
So over the years, we've engaged British Columbians on, uh, we had an initiative called Communities on the Move, where we were trying to advocate for healthy transportation options. And, and in that process, we engaged over 130 organizations that all signed on to a, a declaration called the Communities on the Move Declaration. But in that process, what we heard uh, is that the guidance and advice that works in Vancouver and Victoria just doesn't apply in smaller communities. And that's not surprising as uh, you know, a lot of the research on best practices has really been done in large urban centers uh, where, where there's a very different context. You've got difference in terms of population densities, traffic congestion, uh, transit options, um, and mixed use neighborhoods, um, as well as planning, engineering expertise and budget. So the type of that type of planning and infrastructure that we think of so often with active transportation is not always feasible in smaller communities. And, and then, you know, there's the limitations of a small tax base, a uh, which gives fewer resources for staffing and, and capital and operational uh, budgets. So it's not uncommon for smaller communities uh, to have no transportation planner, uh, and in some cases, no planner at all. So it, it's, it's a very different uh, context. But um, however, what we do, do know is that many small communities are making strides. And there are also assets in small communities that set them up well for active transportation, such as lower and often friendlier uh, traffic. Uh, when you know your neighbors, you, you don't flip them the bird, you, <laughs> you share the road, right? Um, uh, higher levels of community trust, connections, a closer relationship between citizens and, and local leaders, and a smaller geographic uh, footprint. So we set out to take a look uh, what could, uh, what was being done, and, and what could do, uh, what could be done to support biking, walking, and wheelchairing in smaller communities. We wanted to look at the published literature, uh, but most importantly, we wanted to speak to local leaders that were really standing out, that were making a difference in their communities to get a sense of uh, what is really feasible and how were they overcoming some of those barriers and, and taking advantage of those assets. So we develop, uh, we set up our project with an advisory group made up of representatives from several key st stakeholders, including representation from health authorities, some smaller municipalities, some cycling and transportation advocacy groups, as well as the Disability Alliance of BC. And we worked very closely with one of our BCHL uh, members, that is the Union of BC Municipalities. So we conducted a literature review and and, and collected resources specific to small communities. We sent out a survey to all municipalities uh, that were between 1,000 and 30,000 uh, citizens. And, um, and to identify our leading communities, we, we developed a few indicators that we applied to all the communities that fell within that um, size bracket. And then we selected uh, six communities to do more in-depth qualitative research, which included some, some interviews and site visits and, and, and some photo illustration. Um, you know, the research, not surprisingly, identified many barriers that we also heard from our responding communities around, you know, the challenges of having car oriented roads with, you know, lower density levels and greater distances, um, fewer uh, less infrastructure, constrained terrain. Um, highway is a main street is, is a huge uh, issue that came up in all of our case studies. And, you know, that's something that we had to dig into uh, a bit further. And, and then of course there's, um, you know, other issues that, that do tend to uh, uh, be faced in, in communities of all sizes, such as uh, safety concerns and, and bridges. Um, for the, uh, in our work to identify those communities that were standing out, we, as I mentioned, we applied this uh, indicators and we did uh, 
Uh, we wanted to do that in a, a quite a systematic way. So we applied indicators that we could gather using existing uh, data. So we used um, some census data around the commute to work. Uh, we used uh, in British Columbia, we have the Insurance Corporation of BC that which collects uh, data on on <clears throat> on bike and pedestrian collisions. And we looked at communities that had active transportation projects funded uh, with, uh, with Ministry of Transportation funding. And, and you know, we also looked at whether they had a standalone um, uh, transportation, active transportation plan. So we were very pleased, 65% uh, of the communities within that 1,000 to 30,000 uh, range responded to our community. And you can see some of the names of, of the communities in, in our biker there. Um, and for us, that was really um, encouraging because it really confirmed that A, that there's a super high level of interest in this topic in small communities. And, and it also gave us a lot more confidence in, in our survey results. Uh, in our measurement for active transportation progress, we looked at some key metrics around, you know, whether there's some leadership or there's a champion, whether there's support of uh, policies, uh, dedicated staff, funding, um, whether they had a standalone active transportation plan, or, or whether active transportation uh, was um, a part of the official community plan. And then when we look at uh, progress, we see that, um, you know, in, in terms of support of infrastructure, most of the communities had uh, crosswalks in, in busy areas, uh, sidewalks, and, um, and then a, a, a uh, uh, pathways comes up in a, in a big way in small communities. Um, but we were also quite encouraged to see places to sit and benches, because of course we know that is such a, an important feature for an age-friendly community. And when you're trying to extend the trip and, and how important it is for, for seniors to have a place to rest along the route. Um, in terms of barriers, uh, not surprising, we see funding come out as, as the number one top barrier, um, but also inadequate staff capacity. That's that's uh, troublesome. And then there, you know, there's there's a lot of other things that might be experienced by other communities, such as um, you know topography and distances and, and an auto dependent culture. But uh, but what but we do see uh, the conflict between our Ministry of Transportation uh, and Infrastructure and the municipalities' goals, and, and that came up a lot in our in our case studies as well. And then, of course, there's the absence of of having good data. So, um, based on the indicator and survey results, we settled on six communities for our case studies. We have the village of Burns Lake in northern British Columbia, uh, Powell River and Gibsons, which are part of the upper and lower Sunshine Coast, uh, Duncan, which is in the beautiful Cowichan Valley on, uh, in, um, on Vancouver Island, and then Nelson and Roslyn in the interior of British Columbia. And in our um, um, so we did that based on our indicator and, and survey results and, and, our, and our advisory group really suggested that we, we needed to make sure that we had some regional ver variety as well as uh, diverse communities in terms of the culture of the community and um, and that, so we didn't want to have all resort communities for example we wanted some um, you know resource-based communities or, or um, uh, we didn't want to have all coastal communities. And we also wanted to make sure we had some dot, uh, size differentiation. So some on the smaller size and some of the larger size. And now I'm just going to go through some of the uh, case study lessons and I'll go through some of these quite quickly. But, you know, for, for us, this is the really interesting uh, part of, of the research. So in all communities, not surprising to anyone here, collaboration really is key. Um, and all of the communities we spoke 
uh, with a, uh, spoke about the importance of relationships with local community groups, such as cycling groups, seniors organizations, the school community to really make things happen. One of the best examples is in Northern BC, the village of Burns Lake and their partnership with Lake Baby Nation on a shared sidewalk project that serves both uh, communities, uh, you know, both that serves the residents across the community and it's a great, great example of not letting a jurisdictional border get in the way of, of creating a great active transportation network. Um, of course, uh, the, these small communities really re are, are heavily reliant on grants. Um, they need to have proposal ready, construction ready, uh, uh, projects. It can be challenging in smaller communities to get contractors in and, and in places that have a, a longer winter cycle, um, uh, having that the window to, to build in an appropriate time. That was something that was mentioned. Trails, one of the biggest findings in our study was the importance of incorporating a trail network and using rights of ways to create a pleasant network for walkers, bikers, and, and wheelchair users. Um, <clears throat> Rosalind and Burns Lake um, have developed white ways to facilitate snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, and, and fat bikes in, in the winter in the winter months. And, and I just want to note that this is a real big difference in terms of the way we think about active transportation in urban setting where trails are seen as recreation, but in smaller communities, they're really seen as, as part of the active transportation network and they, and they serve the community quite well that way. Um, uh, and of course, residents in smaller communities often use shops and services in multiple places across the region. So it's really important to create connections through, um, you know, whether it's through the regional district or, or just community community um, communication. Um, all of the communities that we did case studies with spoke about uh, an equity uh, lens and an equity approach, uh, whether that was deliberate and by design or it was it or it it just happened. Um, so in Duncan, they've acknowledged that their transportation right in their transportation plan that they have to serve people who cannot or do not drive for a variety of reasons, and they call out income, age, and disability status. They also have a partnership with the adjacent Cowichan tribes on creating uh, better connections on, on the highway uh, because all of those people in, in, in the Cowichan tribes land are, are using our, our are, are regulars in, in the town of, of, of Duncan. And so there's a lot of uh, transportation back and forth. Uh, in Powell River, they have a very cool pilot project uh, for an on-demand bus service uh, that's popular with seniors. And in Nelson, the planner there walked the streets with a visually impaired resident to, to better understand those issues. So uh, this didn't, Equity didn't come up big in our survey results, but in all of the leading uh, communities it came up in a big way. Um, this is a, a universal whenever you're bringing on making changes and, and certainly on active transportation, which sometimes can be divisive in a community. Uh, if you don't get everyone on board, it's it uh, all of our leading communities spoke about the importance of, of getting council on board, but also uh, getting the community on board as well. Place making again, this is a universal for active transportation, but all of our smaller communities also spoke about the benefits in terms of the, the local economy and, and really supporting local businesses as well. So um, up here on the top, we've got um, the, <clears throat> the uh, city of Roslyn. They've incorporated a lot of great uh, um, uh, public art. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Duncan has created this great pocket park with, with seating, uh, which has served the, the local businesses during the pandemic very well. And then Burns Lake has this great uh, lakeside park that uh, connects with all of the, the, the town center as well. Highway as Main Street is a very complex uh, problem in British Columbia, 
most small communities have a highway that goes right through them and it can be very difficult to make the street hospitable uh, for walkers and bikers when the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure is not on side. So we see two uh, different uh, uh, circumstances. So the, the, the image on the left is the village of uh, Burns Lake and on the right is uh, the city of Rosalind. So in, in Burns Lake, they have a problem with transport trucks going through their through their um, community, and and the Ministry of Transportation is um, not down with creating more sidewalks or crosswalks. Uh, whereas the planner in Rosalind has managed to convince uh, the Ministry of Transportation folks uh, to allow for angled parking, wider sidewalks, more crossings across the highway, and that's uh, in part because she's been there for many years and has had to fight them with studies and photos from other jurisdictions, but she has uh, made some progress. So it can be done. Um, then there's, uh, you know, uh, I think this is the case in, in any community, wherever there's work being done on pipes or anything on where the road is dug up, there's an opportunity to add active transportation with any kind of uh, upgrading or, or with new capital work. And then finally, one of the one of the lessons that all of our community says is you can't wait for the perfect plan, the perfect moment, you have to uh, react and start building out that network and don't let that perfect get in the way of the possible. Uh, the town of Gibson's used the example that where they had a bunch of fragmented paths here and there, but eventually they got a, a great uh, grant that allowed them to connect those pieces of the puzzle and now they have uh, a, a great uh, network. So uh, <clears throat> the, the lesson there is, is just to start somewhere. And, and finally, and this is quite interesting, interesting from an equity perspective is that e-bikes have arrived in a big way and it's really changing the transportation landscape. Um, all of our communities mentioned e-bikes. They're seeing a lot more seniors on bikes. <clears throat> and they're also seeing people that are less experienced cyclists as well. And so there is that um, need to build facilities to increase safety for, for those e-bike users um, because we think that it's just, it's just the beginning. And um, finally, I'll just say that we, we've, we've published the report and summary. We've got some great video profiles um, on, on our website. If you just uh, Google Small Towns Big Steps, it's, it's all there. Um, we've also sent uh, the report to every community in that size uh, and, and recently presented at the Union of BC Municipalities Convention. We've got, um, uh, we've, we've highlighted some of the policy issues with decision makers. We've met with the Minister of Infrastructure, Parliamentary Secretary for Rural and Regional Development, and we'll be meeting with the Minister of Transportation in the next few weeks. And, and our hope is that through this project, we've been able to highlight some promising practices, as well as the supports that are needed to create more healthy, active, active equitable, and greener uh, small communities. So thank you. And I will stop right there and uh, pass it on to Ingen. All right, thanks everyone. I'm just going to attempt to share my screen here. All right, maybe Rita, can you give me the thumbs up when you can, if you can hear me and see my screen? Okay, good. That's always my uh, my paranoia, right? With uh, with doing these things, that something's going to happen with the tech and not quite work. So. Um, uh, let me just move something out of the way here. Great. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for, uh, for indulging my part of the presentation and, uh, and great to hear about all of the excellent work happening in Rita and Kate's jurisdictions. So I'd like to just start by honoring the Algonquin Anishinaabe people on whose traditional unceded territory the city of Ottawa is located. And I'd like to extend this respect to all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, their ancestors and elders. So I'm, I'm really excited to share Ottawa's integration of the 15 minute neighborhood as a framework for how the city grows. 
But in telling that story, I'd really like to tell you a little bit about the journey of how we got here and what we really learned along the way. Because when I reflect back, I mean, wow, like our journey of intersectoral collaboration taught me a lot um, and really enabled that innovation that we were looking for. And I say we because I'd be remiss in not giving a shout out to my OPH colleague, Birgen Isenhagen, who is my work sister, who has traveled along with me on this journey. And I, and I forgot to say, I'm Inga Rosendahl from Ottawa Public Health. I'm a registered professional planner uh, with OPH. So just for a bit of context, um, Ottawa has over a million residents. It's the fourth largest city in the country and the second largest in Ontario. I work at OPH, as I mentioned, which is, uh, and I think uh, Kim actually mentioned this at the outset, OPH is a semi-autonomous board of health, and we're also part of the City of Ottawa's municipal infrastructure, so that provides us with some opportunities, uh, which I'll describe to you guys. But before I get into the nitty gritty, if you would just indulge me in a little bit of an anecdote. So, you know that junk drawer in your house? Maybe you don't have one, and if you don't, that's amazing. I wish I could be you. But I have a junk drawer in my house, and it's one, you know, that junk drawer with all the random cords. And you know how frustrating it can be when you need one of those tangled cords to get your tech to work. You're not sure if the cord that you need is in the mess of wires, but you can barely untangle the mess of them in the first place, even just to kind of test it out and see if that's what you need. And you take a deep breath. You take it one step at a time. You ask for help. You look for patterns in the mess. You jiggle one, you jiggle another, and presto, you manage to pull out that hopefully elusive plug that makes the tech work. And how do you feel? You know, I personally, I feel great when that works, right? And that's kind of a flippant way for me to describe uh, my work sometimes as an urban planner, trying to help build healthy communities. I'm gonna try to describe how we've tried to untangle the ideas around healthy community building. It's definitely a work in progress and it's definitely easy to get lost in the wires but it's really rewarding when you can get a mess of them sorted out and that's how I feel about the 15-minute neighborhood both through appealing to the technocratic side of planning including using it as a launch pad for our deep framing of our planning policies as well as a way to make the many connections and things that go into healthy communities easy to easier to understand for the public So that leads me to my series of tips. So tip one, learnings from my journey. Uh, tip number one, learn your context. Uh, in trying to forge a path in another sector, it means we have to understand the context in which they're working. So planning in Ontario and in Canada for that matter is structured around policy directives from the most macro all the way down to the micro, leading to what you see around you in terms of the built form. If you start too far down the micro trail, so for instance, you know, um, us making public health comments on development applications, you run the risk of your comments not being anchored in that provincial or local more macro policy. And for that reason, we really have to think about baking healthy public policy into the more macro planning tools. I think Rita just talked about that sometimes when the provincial legislation isn't quite on side, right? Um, so for us at the city of Ottawa, it's the official plan. The official plan provides the vision of growth for the future of the city, and it's the policy framework to guide its physical development. All other plans and decision making ultimately flow out of it as they relate to the built form. Which leads me to tip two, grab onto opportunities. I was running up against challenges of some of our comments not always being anchored in official plan policies, in my years as a public health planner, and so they wouldn't quite stick, right? So when council directed the city to start working on a new official plan in uh, 2019, this was kind of big because it was a complete rewrite from the old one that was established way back in amalgamation in the early 2000s. So I knew this was gonna be a once in a career opportunity. They don't often get completely rewritten. And it was a really important chance for us to translate the very rich body of evidence that's out there, that's come out, popped out over the years um, on healthy built and natural environments. All right, and that leads me to tip three, collaborating creatively. So we knew that to make a difference, it would take 
more than sending in white papers and research in the hopes of informing that process of, of a new OP. And that providing our comments after policy has been drafted uh, would run the risk of not resulting in the deep integration of health that we were really hoping for. We were really, really lucky because our colleagues over in planning department, they saw things in the same light. They were really committed and are really committed to tackling some very challenging issues. And they invited us to be partners along with them in the process. And it really has been one of the highlights of my career. To make it happen, we established something new. We called it a co-location. So that meant that all, although my colleague Birgit and I uh, report to public health, we were physically and functionally located as part of the official plan team in the planning department. And it really worked, not only because our colleagues in planning saw us as teammates, but we had strong support from senior staff, including our medical officer of health, Dr. Vera Etches, and the general manager of planning at the time, Steve Willis. And in fact, the general manager had said to his whole team, as well as the public, that his goal was to have a healthy official plan. And he really challenged us to make it happen. So he really uh, set a high bar for us collectively. So what did that look like? Well, tip four, uh, as we reflect, is to get in on the ground floor. A brand new official plan, it's a work of some pretty significant complexity. Um, the whole thing, I, got, I don't know if you can see it, sometimes the background fuzzes it out, but the whole thing is like, you know, over 200 pages plus all kinds of uh, schedules and, and, and whatnot. Um, so this co-location allowed us to be part of the process and the conversation right from the beginning which as you can see by this image of the, the triangle can start, it did start a, a bunch of years ago uh, at the bottom of the triangle um, with a lot of inputs and a lot of reports, things that went to council, engaging the public, et cetera, um, along the way. And being co-located meant that we were part of those conversations and we were part of the deliberation of uh, issues and trade-offs. It essentially meant we were doing a live health impact assessment at each of those steps. So tip five, identifying mutually supportive goals. Our new OP was framed around what we call five big moves. They were council approved. And what they were meant to do is recognize the really, really complex problems that we're dealing with today. You know, think climate change, housing emergencies, systemic uh, social injustices, all kinds of uh, all kinds of really big, you know, wicked problems as we call them in planning. They really required us to stretch our imaginations as planners and, and, and think about how we could reframe our thinking. So public health, including climate and resiliency, was one of those anchor ideas. You can see that little pop out of the, the pie slice there that the OP um, in the drafting of this new P, OP had to tackle. So we provided evidence, framed out some of the key planning levers that we need to address them. We dialogued with all other slices of the pie, because of course everything is interconnected, to build awareness of what we need to do to advance health, equity, inclusion, and climate resiliency. The concept of the 15-minute neighborhood, that really was captured in high-level policy directions um, during this phase, so preceding the actual drafting of the OP. And that became one of the key frameworks around which that OP uh, was built subsequently. So the 15 minute neighborhood really allowed us to pursue our goals of embedding climate resiliency, health and equity and inclusion deep into the planning frameworks. Which leads me to tip six, integrate, integrate, integrate. When we got to drafting this new official plan, um, we had a series of strategic directions and cross cutting issues that were included um, kind of in the, the first chunk of the official plan. And you can see those topic areas in the top right of the screen. We also had a section called, or we have a section, I should say, called Healthy and Inclusive Communities, section 2.2.4. I've memorized that for sure. And this is where the broad 15-minute neighborhood concept uh, is outlined for the benefit of the rest of the official plan. And you can see that we have a series of other health intentment, uh, policy intent statements on the screen that, that complement and synergize with that as well. The rest of the official plan, the hundreds of pages of the official plan, has many what we call implementation hooks, though, 
that implement those bigger goals that you see on the screen. And if you um, happen to peruse through our official plan, we've tagged a lot of them with heart icons. Um, and they're in areas like, uh, you know, uh, in urban design, parks, uh, uh, mobility and transportation. Uh, and it reflects back all of those many elements, the kind of the, the nitty gritty stuff that's required to advance walkable 15 minute neighborhoods. Which gets me to tip seven, the, the notion of leveraging sticky ideas. Um, what makes a healthy, resilient and inclusive community? That's the challenge. There isn't like one specific recipe. It's complex, it's concept, context sensitive, um, but the 15 minute neighborhood emerge as a sticky idea to help capture a lot of those different ingredients and the and the different things that we need, um, the new ideas that we need uh, to integrate into planning to advance healthy urban planning um, and allowed us to simultaneously advance those other climate and equity goals as well. And then, of course, you know, the 15 minute neighborhood concept went forward before the pandemic. Um, so we were working on this official plan and we had you know uh, a lot of these reports going to the public right in the middle of the pandemic so the 50 minute neighborhood uh, framework also allowed us to have conversations about pandemic resiliency and how it fosters the conditions for people to thrive when we have these kinds of major societal disruptors which gets me close to the end here on learning uh, about trade-offs it bears mentioning that it wasn't just a question of saying, hey, let's implement the following policies to advance 15 minute neighborhoods. Uh, the devil really is in the details and many policy positions can have unintended consequences um, or have dimensions that just aren't apparent at the outset when we start kind of, you know, digging into it and peeling back the layers of the onion. So we have to listen and collaborate with humility and a willingness to learn while sharing our evidence and perspective and really have those conversations. So we learned a lot about the trade-offs and, and about some of that nitty gritty uh, that we need to consider behind the scenes. And my last uh, tip uh, that I think we learned was to try, test, learn, and then adapt. We learned a lot during those deliberations. We built trust, we leveraged one another's goals. Some approaches and ideas stuck more than others and that's okay, it really is a journey. We recognize that there's an enormous ripple effect from the official plan as a macro policy document um, on future decision making and, and city planning processes and all of those things. So this little image here with the little boats you see on the screen um, is representative of some of those ripple impacts uh, of the official plan and some of the subsequent planning processes that will need to respond to the policy directives in the official plan. And that's going to help inform how our co-location, which will continue into the future, uh, also evolves so that we, you know, end up trying to work with the captains of those various ships to try to integrate the, the, the full potential embedded in the official plan as it relates to health, climate, resiliency and equity into those subsequent planning processes. So I'm really excited and hopeful that we can continue to be the wind behind the sails of our co colleagues as they move forward and we can kind of, uh, you know, coast our way into a, into a healthier uh, future collectively. And that is the end of my part of the presentation. Thank you very much, Inga, Kate, and Rita. Those are all excellent presentations and incredible work that's going on that's really inspiring for others of us across the country. Um, we don't have a lot of time left for questions. There are a number of questions here. Um, um, Kate and, um, and Rita have started to answer some of them simply because we're running out of time. So we'll kind of just go down and kind of look at I think you've answered most of them. Most of these, there's a number of comments here of uh, just thanking you for some of the great work you're doing. So if you could take a peek at those. And then I'm trying to see here, I guess they're all, <laughs> I guess they're all answered. Is that what's happening here? Um, so I think just down here, we'll go down to the end. Um, okay, it's funny. I don't think I'm seeing all the questions actually. Sorry about that. Yeah, Kim, I answered the ones. I answered the ones that were directed at me. I think. Okay, yeah, I'm happy okay. to speak to them. But so I, maybe I we'll start at the very end where we're, we've got um, 
We've got one here. Thanks a lot. I work in public health in a small rural distant region. Can I, and I can see that issues are the same that we live with here. There's more to about this topic. Um, Richard Gould says, I agree with the e-bikes. They're a game changer. I see that um, Richard Gould's also asking if there's been any challenges keeping ATVs off the trails for bikes and pedestrians. Perhaps that's something that you could address, um, Rita. Uh, yeah, I, I actually did take in that answer, but um, but in our in the communities that we spoke with, the ATVs did not come up. But I have a and and I could see how that would be. I've heard that in recreational areas, but because the 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 trails that we're talking about are within the town centers and and within the town limits, I think we don't have the same kind of ATV traffic. A lot of our our uh, you you know, we're talking about uh, connections between uh, linking a, um, <clears throat> you know, a, the end of a street to the school or or a, a pathway that's adjacent to the highway. So it's not uh, it's not a recreational uh, environment. And if I could uh, just say that there's a question here for you, Inga from Kathy Dykeman. How key is having a planner in public health to navigate city planning departments? Oh, that's a great question. I think it's I think it's definitely been helpful because planning is very technocratic. And so we were we're able to kind of um, we function often as translators between the sectors. Um, uh, and I think the deeper you go into the planning process or the, the more technical it gets, uh, the more uh, advantageous it is to have a, a deep knowledge of planning, whether by virtue of being a registered professional planning planner or gaining that expert, getting you know gaining the expertise as you would uh, through your regular work. So for sure, it's been helpful. Mm -hmm. And then another question, um, I think for any of you, but we'll start with Inga from Juan Barnes. He's saying sometimes when pushing for 50 minute neighborhoods, they'll hear from other staff that they want to, that they're, they're addressing electric vehicles and that that's the primary driver. And therefore, you know, they don't need to look at the longer term changes to the built form. They want to know, um, Rob wants to know to what extent are others of you hearing that kind of argument and do you have any suggestions for countering that? So let's start with you, Inga, and then maybe we'll go over to you. Um, Kate and Rita. Yeah, I know. I know that in Ottawa they did some really um, uh, a, a sort of a technical assessments through energy evolution in Ottawa to to project and and quantify the amount of emissions and the reductions that are needed in what sector or what you know kind of uh, from what part of society uh, as compared with another. So I I don't have I don't have the specificity just to, to speak really, really deeply on that, but I mean certainly you know switching to electric vehicles is going to be important, but so is switching to sustainable modes of transportation and, and ensuring our building stock becomes more sustainable as time progresses too. Kate, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, would you mind repeating that question, Kim? I think basically um, this person's asking. They're saying that. The, what they're hearing from other departments in their area is that um, they're saying, well, we're, we're, we're accommodating electric vehicles. That's the most um, likely or the, the greatest source of emissions from the transportation sector so that they don't really want to address some of the longer term built environment issues. So just kind of looking for some advice in terms of how you might counter those arguments from other departments. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we've, we've run into, um, I wouldn't call it a challenge, but conversation points where there's, um, you know, the perspective of we're already addressing social determinants of health, I think we're, we're good. Um, so it's just kind of that back and forth of there's always opportunities to amplify health impacts, uh, see our process as a way to push any work forward that you'd like to have done, um, and then reiterating the importance of all sectors um, are responsible for health. But uh, I think the open like the open communication across uh, divisions has been really crucial and the relationship building helps uh, so people know that we're not there to um, take over their work or tell anybody what to do, but to kind of work together to improve health. Thank you for that. And if I can kind of go back to one of the questions, and I think you answered it online, but I think it's still a useful one for other people to hear. Kathy Dykeman was asking what disciplines are represented on your team. And so maybe if you could share that with all of us. Yeah, absolutely. So I mentioned that um, our, our priority was to have representation across divisions, uh, first and foremost, rather than necessarily disciplines. But some of the disciplines that are um, on the team include health promoters, 
Um, we have one health promoter um, who has 20 years experience in active transportation work. So she's been an, a great value add. So we have quite a few content experts. We have project managers who are familiar with, you know, going through these projects that we might be doing HAs on. We have um, a financial specialist usually there who helps us from the budget side of things. Um, so it's a bit of a range of disciplines, but um, it's always been kind of meant to be representative of each of their divisions rather than the role itself, but it's something, an important question. So um, it actually prompted me to kind of go look back at our, our team list to see, to make sure that we have representation of disciplines. So thank you for that question. There's a number of other questions here, but I am concerned about time. So Ian, um, oh, Rita, would you like to weigh in on that? I just wanted to go back to the electric vehicle question because I think that's uh, really important. Um, and, and my response to something like that would be yes and. Yes, electric vehicles are part of the solution and they certainly address things like uh, greenhouse gas emissions and localized air quality. From a health perspective though, we know that active transportation is one of the best bangs for bucks in terms of physical activity. And we also have to acknowledge that there are many people who cannot and do not drive. And we need to create communities that work for people with disabilities, that work for children, that work for seniors, and that work for, for people that cannot afford or don't want to drive. And, and I think that's really an important message for those people that are saying electric vehicles are going to uh, save it. Yes, they're an important part of the equation, but they're not, they're not the only thing. And certainly for an equitable uh, community, they're, they're really um, not accessible to everyone. Thanks, Rita. Over to you, Ian. Thank you so much uh, to all of our panelists, Kate, uh, Inga, and, and Rita, for a great presentation today. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, great questions. Uh, the webinar uh, will be posted to CPHA, CPHA's YouTube channel, and every registrant will be receiving notice when that becomes available. Uh, and to just to follow up on the last point, we need to challenge the, the dominant narratives when it comes to uh, action in this area and keep equity uh, top of mind as we move forward. Thank you so much, Kim, for moderating today's session. You did a great job as always. Uh, have a great day and look for our next webinar, uh, which is scheduled for sometime in the winter. Uh, so take care, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye.